Here we go. Hey, 2KWE Small Austin is here. No introduction needed. You see it right there. Sabu, thank you for joining us. The master of hardcore. Thank you. Welcome. How you doing, brother? Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm doing pretty good today. Better than I was yesterday. Salud. To step up. Cheers to you. It's one o'clock. We're on. I have a good idea. Cheers. There you go. There you go. I like what are you drinking. I am drinking a Budweiser for you, my brother. Yeah, I'm not much of a drinker. I, I like smoking, so I, I got a little THC. I'm a big smoker too. I finished smoking before we joined before we joined up together. So <laughs> usually I'm smoking and drinking on the interviews. But I like keeping things organic. I want to uh, uh, set out my appreciation for you joining me here. And let's get to it. Sabu. I read a little bit. I know everybody knows what they think they know about you. But this interview in the next 30 minutes, I want you to tell people what they don't know about you. Something new, something something that the, the fans might get a kick out of that they don't know. Because everybody thinks they know everybody and know everything. So how how did you start off in professional wrestling? Well, uh, I don't know if you know, but my uncle was the Sheik. Yes. And... Uh... You know, ever since I was like three years old, I realized he was famous, and I realized what he did. And I, I, I knew. I always say when I was three years old, I knew I was gonna be a wrestler. I probably didn't know then, but but I had the feeling that I, I had a connection with with whatever he was doing when I was about three years old. So uh, when I got about thirteen or fourteen, I tried to train in amateur wrestling, and then uh, when I got uh, nineteen, uh, I got shot in the face, and then after I got out of the hospital. Uh, I called my uncle and said I wanted to be a wrestler, and he said, "Well, come on out, and we'll start you out." So he started when I was 19. I started training. I, I, I wrestled five years amateur first, though. Did you yeah. uh, did you have a hard time getting into it, learning the trade, the craft, or did it come second nature? Um, it it, 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 it was kind of second nature, except for it was hard to get my first lesson. For me to get my first lesson in actual wrestling, wrestling, not not life or or, or any other things, but wrestling, I had to set my I had to set my ring up, my uncle's ring up for seven months in the morning and tear it down at night every night for seven months and not question him why am I not in the ring? He just said, "Don't ask me no questions, just trust me." And I said, "Okay." So he goes, "Put the ring up." So I put the ring up. I said, "All right, we're gonna train." He goes, "Now tear it down." I go, "Okay, tear it down." <laughs> then the next day, same thing for like seven months and. And I, I go, fuck, we're not getting nowhere. Finally, he let me train in that. So I had to earn the right to actually start training. You don't, you, you know, um, the guys talk about paying their dues now. So they call paying their dues by paying a dollar. Paying a dollar is not paying your dues. That's a tuition. Paying your dues is fucking hard work and breaking your back. That's true. That is true. I, and you I had to do my dues every step of the way for my uncle, with my uncle, for my uncle. You know, every step, he didn't let me slide it off. Right. And, you know, working with family, family's a little bit more rough because they expect more from you. Exactly. He, he always said, because you're my nephew, don't mean you're going to make it. I go, I know that. And he goes, yeah, that's the wrong attitude. I said, OK, sorry. <laughs> right. But, but I knew I knew I didn't, I didn't want to make it just because I was a relative. I wanted to make it because I knew I had something. Well, ever since I was three years old, I had I had that fire in me and I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And what I read somewhere, what was your first wrestling name? I want to verify that. The first wrestling name was Terry SR. And I, I don't know what the SR stands for exactly. Some uh, say Sheik's Revenge or something like that. But I, or Sheik would say as a joke, super race. You know, like the Arabs are super race. Right. But he never told me and he said, don't ask me. So I never asked him. Other people would ask him and he shut them down. He wouldn't tell them. But uh, that because... When you first start wrestling, your first five years, I was Terry Nobody. The, nobody's going to know. remember those years anyways. We didn't know about videotapes back then right. or internet back then or cheat sheets back then. We didn't know about that stuff. We figured after you wrestle, it's forgotten unless it was on TV. So when I was Terry Nobody, uh, those matches I thought were forgotten, but some of them popped back up right now and then. But then after five years, my uncle named me Sabu the Elephant Boy. Sabu, that's what I wanted to get to. <laughs> Sabu the Elephant Boy. Where did that one come from? Okay. Uh, my uncle was a big fan of Sabu, the, 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 the movie The Jungle Book. Sabu was the actor in The Jungle Book. Yes. So he's a big fan of him growing up. And uh, 
He wanted to name his first son Sabu, and my aunt went mad him. So they named the dog Sabu, a, a white German shepherd. And the dog died, he named Sabu. But Sabu the elephant boy means, uh, an elephant boy is like a cowboy. They herd elephants. It's like a dangerous job in India, but don't mean shit here. It sounds like a joke. So uh, uh, we dropped the elephant boy and just kept Sabu. And it worked out great That's for you. It. And it yeah. worked out great. Because it's not, it's, not it's not the name, it's what you make of the name. No, that is true. No, it is, is a good name, and it fits my character, and it fits my look about that. I'm lucky for that, but it's, but it's also just the name. You got to make something out of it. That is true. You are what you make yourself to be. You know. So, and and how long did it take for you to like get into like the hardcore stuff? Was it a slow progression or? It wasn't hard. It, it was a progression. Yes. You don't start out your first year of hardcore matches. My first five years, I didn't leave the ring. I barely went to the top rope. I was a first match guy. I did first match things. You know, I, I, I knew my role back then. So um, you, you, you don't start out with uh, barbed wire matches. Those are years later. That was seven, eight years into my career before I had a barbed wire match. Seven, eight years before I had a cage match. Seven or eight years before I had a, a stupid death match, you know. And these guys are you're starting out in their first year wrestling having death matches, which is crazy, you know. You don't know how to wrestle yet. But uh, I don't approve of that that way, but uh, that's the way it is, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I progressed into hardcore. You know, there was no say, all right, this is hardcore, you go do it. Hardcore just became meant um, no no style, brawling. That's what hardcore meant. Like, no more wrestling, now it's a brawl, now it's a fight. Right. That's what it really meant. You know what it meant to me, when people brawl or did hardcore stuff, they were taking it easy. They are taking shortcuts. I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, Who instead was, of working hard, they cut themselves. I'm I'm assuming and, uh, you're, I, I, dis I disapprove of that. I'm assuming you looked up to your uncle. He was a hero to you. Uh, he probably was your favorite wrestler. But other than your uncle, when you were growing up, who did you idolize in the business? Who was your favorite wrestler when you were a kid? Well, I, I only idolized him growing up. As I got to my teens, I, I liked Jimmy Snuka. And I, and I found out about Tiger Mask. And uh, oh. those guys blew me away. Jimmy Snooker's look and Tiger Mask's uh, moves, they blew me away. And so um, my uncle told me early on to pattern myself after three wrestlers who I think are great. But don't tell anybody. So I'm going to tell you now who they are. The, I pattern myself after the Sheik, Jimmy Snooker, and Tiger Mask. Those three together, in my mind, became is Sabu. That's Sabu style. In my, in my mind. It might not look like it, but in my mind, it feels like it. You know, that's an interesting concept, you know, and it works for you and it, and it moved yeah. you along in your career. Malcolm said, it's good to look up to somebody, but don't look up to one guy, you know, don't settle on one guy to look up to. Malcolm always said, don't, don't just look up to me, look up to somebody else too. And so I did, you know. Right. And I don't look up to him the same as I look up to him, but, but still. You know. what, 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 what did you have difficulty getting a hold of early on in your training? Like I, 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 I've been training them. Promos were the worst thing. Uh, wrestling was fine. Uh, anything in wrestling, you know, uh, physical, I, that was easy. When it came to talking, I, I couldn't do it. And uh, one time I was in Hawaii and they put a microphone in front of me and I stuttered and couldn't talk. My uncle said, never speak again. I said, I won't. <laughs> see, what really got me was when I was about 14 years old, me and my mom was watching Georgia wrestling. And everybody cut a promo the same, yelling and screaming. The next guy yelling and screaming. The next guy yelling. They kind of, if you close your eyes, it all sounds like the same guy. So my mom said, promise you, when you do this, when you do that, wrestle, but you won't do that. Don't embarrass me. And I said, mom, I'll never say a word. No, I don't say a word because my I made a promise to my mother and can't talk for shit. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I have a phobia about talking, speaking in public. Right now it's easy because I'm, you know, talking to a telephone, talking to you. But, uh, if I, was a, if I was a part of a crowd, I'd be really uh, tongue-tied. Right. Now, Jimmy Snuka and Curious the Sheik. The curious, curious thing for me in wrestling is having to talk. That's the scariest thing for me. Ha having to talk, yeah. It, you, getting out in the camera, it's, it takes a little bit of practice, right? It takes a little bit of practice. Oh, well, yeah. It's a, hard, it's, a, it's a more difficult skill than people... No, you know it's it's so difficult. I can't do it. Let's let's fast forward a little bit. What um you're you're in the business. 
you seven years before you started doing your first hardcore match um you start building a reputation scars all over your body um what was the first uh wrestling promotion was it ecw that was like really getting your name out there or well yeah i i got my big break in japan in 1991 november 1991 for fmw and then i came to uh ecw in 1993 i don't remember what month but 99 i think it was cold uh 1993 and yes so uh you know fmw gave me the playground to develop myself and an ECW gave me an, uh, a stage to show it off. Now, did you really have like a lot of stories are out there on in you know independent wrestling world that you know it was uh, it was wild back there backstage ECW. Uh, Paul Heyman gave these guys a lot of freedom, and you know was 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 that a good thing or was it a bad thing? It's a good thing. Uh, it's not a good thing for everybody, but it's a good thing to to be able to express yourself like that. If someone says, you know, act like something you're not or act like yourself, it's easier to act like yourself, you know. And right. even if yourself isn't what you're acting like, whatever you want to act like, if that's easiest and you're best at it, that's what you should do. I, I like guys who are themselves, you know. Like Taz. When Taz was, uh, you know, started out in ECW, he was like a Fred Flintstone type character. And then he then he, he genuinely disliked me. And he cut a pro about fuck said, what about Taz? And that wasn't written or planned. That was from his heart. And that made him. Because Paul Lee gave him the, the opportunity to be himself. Not not to stifle himself no more. Not to be somebody else. Right. That's the way good. Taz, act, the way Taz acts and talks now, that's really him. He's not acting. He's really he's like that. Right. It's better to portray yourself than an imaginary character. Or at least a closer version of yourself or more hyped up version it's, it's easier to be yourself than some somebody else it's way easier it's now <laughs> now man i see the i see the scars all over your body you paid dues way beyond and above the call of duty um what is the pre-match rituals that you sabu have to go through mentally and physically to go out there and do one of those matches are you scared? Are, um, are you nervous? Uh, yes, not not because I'm scared of the barbed wire. I'm scared of every match. Not scared. I'm nervous about every match. Even if it's a little run-in spot where I just throw a chair or something, I'm super nervous leading up to the match. Like the last 30 minutes before the match, I'm, I'm on pins and needles. But um, uh, I, at an average day, um, you know, I'm super nervous. I, I'd eat a little bit in the morning, nothing in the afternoon, and nothing before the match. And uh, right before the about an hour before the match, I'd go for a run, uh, run as hard as I could for about 20 minutes, and then uh, that that would calm me down a little bit. But I'd still be super nervous. But I'm super nervous right up until I go through the curtain. Then it goes away. Like I can't wait to get into the ring. Like I, I don't want to get in the ring right away, but I can't wait to get you know, get in the ring. I can't wait. Who? And like my uncle used to say, my uncle used to say, when they play your music, give it time, and then go out there. And then I'm dancing around, I can't do it. Then he goes, fuck it, just go. So I so as soon as they play that music, I go. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait no more. Who who was your toughest opponent? Uh like toughest toughness or like toughest hard. However you consider it to be. Whatever you consider to be tough motherfucker. Who was the toughest motherfucker you've wrestled with? They really gave you some good uh, potatoes, it, uh, like, oh shit, he's hitting me. Hard to narrow it down, but like Sandman and Van Damme, they're pretty tough. Taz is tough, you know. The, a Dreamer's tough, but uh, like probably the toughest would probably be Terry Funk, because tough doesn't mean you can take it. Tough means you can do it when you're still hurting. Yeah. It takes a tough guy to get up and walk while you're hurting, or, or to run while you're hurting, or to or willingly take a bump while while your back is broke, or or your neck is fucked up, and really, that's tough. Tough isn't because you you can take it. If you can take it, that's not tough. That's a God-given thing. What's tough is, is getting up and doing it again, <laughs> you know, and doing it when you're hurt and doing it when you're tired and doing it when every day. Like, you know, I, I heard Shane McMahon gets heat for taking these big bumps every now and then when we do it every day. 
except for you know not off the ceiling, but still like <laughs> you make it light that he can take a big bump and get up and walk because he don't have to wrestle enough tomorrow and he don't have to make a living doing that. He can he can risk getting paralyzed because he's gonna be taken care of if he's paralyzed. If we get paralyzed, we're not taken care of. Even if we're rich, we're not taken care of. Right, and you know I'm I'm glad that you um, said about that. I, I I believe there should be some type of a uh, health plan for wrestlers, some type of unionized um, retirement plan, a universal retirement plan. What are your thoughts about that? Not that we, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah, I'd like a retirement plan and all that stuff, but that would only work for WWE because the guys who in the Indies wouldn't be able to collect it, right? Because they, they, they never worked there. Like uh, there was that lawsuit was going around about the concussions, and I got begged to put in it. I didn't want to be put in it because I was always in WWE per year. And, then, and guys were making fun of me saying, oh, your injuries weren't done in there in WWE. You were done before that and after that. I go, you're right, but I was forced to do it. I didn't want to do it, you know? Right, so, right. I think know, that would be a beneficial thing. It was all the WWE. They were all the other things. But um, for a pension, you can't give an independent guy pension if he doesn't have a, like a, a contract, like a, a check stuff, you know? Right. Right, and, right. And the U.S. Don't, don't, they don't make much money. They get paid cash. You know those deathmatch guys, they barely make a couple hundred bucks, barely. That's it. That's a couple of hundred bucks, and that's paying dues. Promoters abuse them because they're willing to do anything for almost nothing, and promoters take advantage of that. Right. What is your – you have so many memorable matches. What is your personal favorite one, if you have one, a one or two, three – um, besides my matches with RVD, uh, I'd be cheating if I said any of those because I trained him. But uh, the, the match I had with Taz in 1993, the very first one uh, in ECW, my first match in ECW, 1993 versus Taz, was my best one, the most memorable. There was only 200 people there, and that's what sparked the fire for ECW. And that's your most memorable match? No. I remember that match like it was yesterday. And when I watch it on TV, I relive it. Now, what do you think of the future of wrestling? I, I, I don't know. I don't watch it, like, uh, follow it. I, I'll watch it if, uh, if I put it to the channels and it on, and I'll stay watching it if it's somebody I want to wrestle. If it's a promo or a bunch of guys I don't know, I just put the channel on it. I, I don't have no personal opinion really about it. You know, uh, I, I'm not in the business no more, so, so I really can't say what, you know, I have no room to say nothing. When was your last official match? Um, it was before the pandemic. I wrestled twice after the pandemic, but I was hurt, and I wouldn't. I I was forced to do those. It was before the pandemic. Uh, I can't remember, but it it was a while ago. Before the pandemic, uh, do you foresee yourself getting back in the ring in any capacity? Not maybe a match, but you know, a manager role. Uh, general manager role or something like that. I, I would like to. I would like to do managers, but I don't talk. Uh, I guess I could probably learn to talk, but I don't talk. So th there'd really be for nothing for me to do other than run-ins, and I can't run no more. <laughs> but um, <laughs> walk-ins. Uh, yeah, I want to do something. I'd rather do something behind stage. I don't want to be on camera no more. You know, maybe uh, training. Maybe training. Well, training well, the new generation. Well, I'm going bald and I'm skinny now and I, and I and I'm hurt so I I, I can't get back there. I won't take my shirt off again. I won't take my shirt off again. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Dark part of the room. I was mad because I didn't think they were gonna make me take my shirt off. They go, "Would you take your shirt off?" I go, "All right." I go, oh, fuck, I didn't shave and not tanned, and I'm skinny. And I go, no, nah, we'll just do this tomorrow. They go, no, that's good enough. We got it. Like, damn. I was hoping they wouldn't use it, but they did use it. <laughs> you know, I got the shape and I was pale. Now, have you thought about opening a school up? And training? Not really. It's, uh, I get guys all the time want me to train them, but no, I, I don't want the responsibility of a school. It's, it's too much work. So you just want to enjoy your your rest of your life just doing what Sabu does, huh? Trying to. Yeah. Like I live out here in Vegas, so it's pretty cool out here. I, I, I love it out here. And uh uh You live in Vegas. Yeah. I'll be I'll be in Vegas March seventh. Yeah. We should get together and, and, and have a smoke. Right. 
March 7th. We passed March 7th already. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, May 7th. May 7th. Uh, I'm booked somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I just took a book in this morning for me. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. Right there in Massachusetts. Ooh, so you'll be in... Okay, so let's talk about that. You took a booking, and what is this going to uh, entail? You know, you're not wrestling. You, you don't like doing promos. <laughs> Say again? It's an autograph signing. Ah, autograph signing. It's just a meet and greet, an autograph signing. Okay, and, 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 and this is in Massachusetts. Okay. Where? Is it a part of a, 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 oh, a, a WrestleCon or what? Um, I, I don't know. I didn't ask him. But uh, I got a few other things coming up. Like for uh, Game Changer, I did a couple things for them for GCW. Right. And uh, uh, I got the uh, WrestleCon coming up in Dallas you know, on, on the 1st of, my, uh, 1st of April. Are you going to be but, in uh, Dallas for the no, Mania Week? Uh, what's that? I couldn't hear you. Are you going to be in Dallas for WrestleMania weekend? Yes, that's us. Yes, uh, WrestleCon. Oh, so you'll be at WrestleCon. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll be I'll be over there oh, in yeah. Dallas. I'll be in Dallas. Maybe we'll get together and have that smoke in Dallas then. Yeah, yeah, right on. We got about eight minutes left, and I wanted to speak to you about somebody that's near and dear to your heart, the genie. She recently passed away. And and I know she's a special person for you. Let, let, how did that come about? That's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, uh, her name is Super Genie Melissa Coates. Uh, she was a body professional bodybuilder. Uh, she took Madden Miss Olympia and won a bunch of, won a bunch of uh, professional bodybuilding tournaments uh, or competitions. I mean, and uh, she was a pro wrestler. And I met her 20, 20 years ago in uh, Los Angeles, but but I was married, and uh, so we just remained friends throughout the years. And then I met up with her again uh, seven, eight years ago, and uh, we started dating. And uh, well, I met with her seven, eight, eight years ago, and I made her my super genie, like Barbie Eaton, and uh, like I do the genie. And then I, we started dating after I made her my super genie. And you guys I'm divorced now from from my ex wife. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course, and um, you guys just formed a bond, and she was, she was uh, um, accompanying you into the ring and, yeah, and wrestling she, promotions uh, and stuff. Yeah, she ended up being my road manager. The thing about uh, Super Genie Melissa, uh, she she was my road manager, so to speak. She handled all my books and my life coach. You know, if it wasn't for her, uh, I'd still be broken in half because she made me get my hip fixed. Like, she forced me to get my hip fixed. I didn't want to do it. But, uh, not because I, I didn't want to do it. That's not the fuss. And uh, she forced me to do it, and it was the best thing I could have done. And now I can walk. Uh, and if it wasn't for her, I would have never done it. And she, she's, like, the only person uh, that understands me and, and still likes me. <laughs> still likes me. <laughs> right. But... Um, she was uh, she was my life coach too. She, like I said, she kept me in line and and uh, made the best out of me. Charity in Thunder Bay, Ontario, for a scholarship and a amputee charity here in Las Vegas or in the states. I mean, well, we're setting up a we're going to do a thing for a charity for them, but uh, we're not doing nothing for ourselves. You know, uh, right. the money we raised for her leg, we had to spend on her funeral and her well, autopsy. So uh, we don't want to give more money. Roger that, Roger that. Well, your your heart's in a in a great place, and I know she meant the world to you. And my condolences to you. She meant more than the world to me. I, I cared for her more than I cared for myself. No, right. I, don't, I don't even. Uh, no, I don't do. Anyways, yeah, I, she meant the world for sure. It's all right, brother. You know, and such is life. I'm sort of a warrior monk, and I feel that real life begins after we pass on. So wherever the genie's at right now, she's doing way much better than what we are doing right now. That's how I feel, my personal feeling. Well, I agree. She's got to be doing better than me. I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to live more. Nah, yeah. brother, you have so much to go in for yourself. So many people want to sit and talk with you and pick your brain. You have a lot of experience to share with the world. 
A lot of young talent looks up to you and they want to pick your brain. They want to learn from you, brother. So you have a lot to give. This 30 minutes that you given me is giving me a lot more than you think. And I hope that just speaking about it helps you feel a little better about it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, brother. I really do appreciate it. And from the bottom of my heart, everybody at 2KWE, they love you. They respect you um, for everything that you've done for the business. And you're a pioneer, brother. They don't do shit like that no more. You're the last of the <laughs> Mohicans. You know that? You're the last of the Mohicans, brother. Uh, you might be right. Who, the, so who right. the fuck is diving off of balconies on triple stack tables with light, um, light um, tubes? Nobody. Nobody. They're trying. I've never, never done it with light tubes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just gave you an idea for the out-of-retirement match. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The, I am going to have one more match when I can get back, if I can get back in shape. You know, I, I, right now, I got spinal stenosis. You know, my back is broke. My, I need a knee replacement. And I need a shoulder replacement. And uh, unless I can get my back fixed, I can live with the knee and the shoulder. I can't live with my back like that. You know, it's my center of gravity. But if I can get my back fixed, I'll have another match. Well, we'll be we'll be there to support you for your final run. And like I said, anybody want to get in contact with Sabu and book you for an interview or meet and greets? How do they do that? Uh, you can uh, get a hold of me on Twitter at at the real Sabu ECW, or you can get me on uh, Terry Brunk on Facebook, or that's good enough. Oh, at the real Sabu ECW on Instagram. Roger that. So. Hopefully, we'll be able to see each other in Dallas. I'll be there Friday the 1st until Monday the 4th. I got a couple of events. Right on. I, I, I'm the same. I think at least Sunday, though. But but uh, either way, uh, remind me and we'll get together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you do for the industry. And hey, keep did, moving hey, forward. Hear, I forgot one thing. Did you hear that Paul Heyman says that uh, I might be inducted in the Hall of Fame next year? Wow, it's way you know, overdue. I, but I always talk shit about the WWE Hall of Fame. I go, it's the thickest Hall of Fame there is. I'm going to take it back. <laughs> but if, if they call you, you got to go, brother. You got to go. I could use the payday. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right, brother. Yeah. There it is, the man, the legend, Sabu. You see it here, Stone Cold, small Austin, having a beer. He had a smoke. I had my smoke before. So thanks for joining us. And that's it. We're out of time. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold, small Austin says so. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Catch me at... WrestleMania 38. I'll be up and around giving small stunners. <laughs> See you next time on The Shoot with Sam Schluter next time. Or maybe me. Who knows? <laughs>